My name's Tallulah. I'm a self-taught artist from New Zealand. Um, I lived a long time in England, in London and then in Brighton and Sussex. And in my late 20s, when my children were born and growing up, I started painting. I used to take my two daughters to school and run back home with the baby in the buggy and set my easel up in the kitchen and paint all day while the baby sort of bounced in the chair watching Teletubbies on TV. And then when three o'clock came, I'd wrap everything up and put it all away again and run and get the girls and bring them home from school and pretend like it hadn't happened. And I tried lots of different styles of painting. I, I, never really read any books about how to paint. It was more um, reading about artists. And of course, the, in the early days, I was very interested in the Impressionist artists, um, particularly Van Gogh and, and Monet, and um, would look at their work. And I think what I liked about it was the, the colours and the light that they used and the mark making. And I've always been fascinated with that idea of making marks on canvas to create a, an illusion of something or um, an impression of something rather than being realistic. I've never really done any realism work at all. And uh, I was working on quite large canvases early on with using acrylic paint when I first started and would use old family photos or photos of holidays and by the beach, you know, landscapes and I would draw them up and have a go at painting them and not, and not being very good at it but I, you know, I never really gave up and I just kept trying and trying and often painting over old paintings and then painting over them again until the canvases would get so clogged up with paint that you couldn't do any more on them and then I would have to take the pins out of the back of the canvas and throw the old canvas away and restretch a new one on and start all over again. And, you know, not having a lot of money, being a young family, bringing up a young family, you know, money was tight, so you, you had to kind of reuse things as much as possible and, and um, spend as little as possible because, you know, I wasn't selling anything and um, I would give, paintings away to friends and quite embarrassed now to see them hanging in their homes still today and especially um, a friend that I had in the south of France that I used to go and stay with every year we used to go there for holidays with the family and um, she's still got some of my paintings in her holiday home in Mansonville in France and and you know really they're quite terrible <laughs> but that, you know, it was fun and I used to take photos of the kids swimming in the pool, in the swimming pool that they had there and then of the sunflower fields that were growing beside the house. And uh, I'd set my easel up in the patio beside the swimming pool and I would paint there in my bikini and with my sun hat on and my shades on and paint all day long in the, you know, the hot French sun and then drink wine all evening and start again the next day. And, and you know, I, I just really loved it. And, I, and once I got started painting, I just never really stopped. And would try all sorts of different types and, you, you know, styles. I, I got quite interested in pointless painting for a while. And, um, and I couldn't be bothered doing the tiny little dots. I used to do these great big chunky dots on the canvas and... So I, I used to call it dabbleism, <laughs> and I dabbed them on. And surprising enough, those landscapes were very popular. And I even had a couple of small galleries who would say, "People really like these. Keep doing, keep doing that. That's what people like." And um, and I don't really like it when you're told by a gallery or anybody what to paint. I don't think it's right to tell an artist what to paint. And you know, really, in the first kind of 10, 20 years of painting, I was just really practicing and learning t techniques and styles and, and learning how to 
manipulate paint and I was learning about composition and and you know learning when I say that I'm saying you know, by trial and error I would try things and stand back on the other side of the room and look at paintings for a long time from a distance and and then I would walk out of the room and then walk back in and then I would <laughs> I used to do this thing where I would pace backwards and forwards in front of them and sort of glance at them briefly over my shoulder to try and see if they were making sense or not and, and whether they were working and um, and you know they just trying to to find my own style and find my own voice with the work and and I don't think I did that for a very very long time and for a long time I was just attempting different techniques of way of painting and I tried oil painting and um, with landscapes I used to paint plein air quite a bit out when we got back to New Zealand I used to paint down by the lakes at Rotorua and um, set up my easel beside the lake and paint the water and the sky and the hills and um, and you know try to feel like you're in the moment and and saying something about what you're seeing and and all the though the works were you know kind of nice and um, quite pleasant to look at and the the colors were good and it was quite a nice composition I, I really didn't feel that I'd found myself and I, I became very frustrated and after living in England for quite a number of years um, immigrated back to New Zealand with the with the children and it you know it was great to get back to New Zealand and it was New Zealand is compared to living in London or, or in England it's it was so much quieter and the pace of life is a lot slower and and there's more time to contemplate and there's not such a rush going on and and I think I eased into the art much better and um, I made time for it and um, I didn't feel so harassed about it and and I became more confident obviously because I've been painting for you know for quite a number of years by then and was starting feeling a lot more confident about the work and started exhibiting in you know small locations you know like everybody does start in a cafe and then you build up to the local garden centre and eventually into small retail galleries that you know sold other things as well but as well as some art and and again you know the work was as I say it was nice and it was people kind of liked it and I was selling the occasional work which was great because then I could afford to buy new paint and new brushes and, and more canvases and so there was there was some money coming in I couldn't live off it but there was some money coming in and I didn't feel so bad about the expense of art supplies which everybody knows are very expensive and um, so the even though the work was okay, you know, it was just okay and and I okay just wasn't good enough for me and, and being nice just wasn't good enough for me and um I felt disillusioned with it and um you know, I used to complain to my husband about, you know, it's just it's not going anywhere. I can't seem to find my voice or what I'm meant to be doing and and I was quite frustrated. And, you know, he said to me, oh, why don't you just do something completely different and, and do abstract? And, um, yeah, and I thought, okay, just dump the portraits and the still life and the landscapes and, and I'll have a go at doing abstract work. And so, I, you know, it was so challenging because it's just, it's not something that um, comes easily to you and... and how do you make a composition out of something that's abstract and how do you how do you even begin and and what is it you're trying to say and and um how do you create a work that people are interested in looking at and and sort of can connect to and and um so the whole thing became very um difficult to free myself up i um 
tried using different mediums. I thought if I could use different mediums for working that I could approach the making in a completely different way. And so one of my ideas was to, um, because I was interested in the whole climate change thing, uh, to use plastic. And I decided that I was going to paint on the canvas, but also to attach plastic to the canvas and fabric and in a kind of a collage way, but also in a 3D way so that the plastic was sticking out from the canvas and creating these, um, yeah, 3D works that, that kind of came forward out of the out of the canvas and um and you couldn't just kind of stick a paper cup on it and I decided that I was going to put plastic on it but also that I was going to use a heat gun and then melt the plastic so that it became kind of shriveled and blackened and um, molded into unusual shapes and and these um I would either nailed to the corners of the canvas or attach in whatever ways I could find to to attach things to and then I found different ways of attaching fabric and layers of fabric to the canvas and then I would spray paint over them um, and then paint over them again and so I was incorporating this 3D image into the into the painting and um, I quite enjoyed it. it was it was kind of liberating and there was no kind of expectations around it so you know the um the fun and the playfulness of it took over and the um what the how kind of attitude you know who <laughs> who gives a damn but just give it a go and see what happens and um one of the images that i finished quite a large um, piece i entered in a competition in um, new zealand and got to become a finalist and it was hung on one of the museum spaces and so that was quite exciting and um, thrilling. I'm sure people probably walked past and looked at it and thought, what the hell, <laughs> what is that? And, um, you know, people are quite conservative in New Zealand and um, to challenge people is to try and get a, to garner interest is not so easy and I'm sure that is in lots of countries as well. So the, the by using different these different mediums and, and things and loosening up, then the abstracts came in a little bit free and I managed to um, get the interest of a art dealer in Auckland who suddenly wrote to me and said that she liked what I was doing with the collage work and um, would I like a show and you know, I was very excited and my husband and I were very excited about the whole idea and the art dealer in Auckland, you know, offered me a show and but said that I needed to um, get out of all these small galleries that I'd been exhibiting in and just concentrate on her. And, you know, I took her advice on that and um, and I only stayed in one gallery and then with her and um, pulled out of all the others and took my work back and um, concentrated on doing these new series of work for the solo show that I was to have in Auckland and um, you know the day of the show came and of course very anxious and nervous and um, you know to just put it bluntly it was a disaster because um, although this art dealer had in, in her early years been um, very well known and um, and very good at what she did. She was quite elderly now and, you know, quite frankly had a drinking habit and um, she had lost a lot of her um, popularity and um, people didn't believe in her anymore and nobody came to the opening. None of her so-called mailing list came and there was just me and a few members of my family and nothing sold and, you know, and a few weeks later the show came down and that was the end of it and suddenly I was in this situation where there was nowhere to exhibit my work because I'd pulled out of everywhere and, um, you know, there was a sense that nobody liked what I was doing with the new work and, you know, I was so disheartened I, I became extremely depressed. And, it, you know, it wasn't long after that time that um, 
I, my husband and I, I said to him, I couldn't live where we were anymore. You know, our kids had grown up and left and I was feeling that emptiness syndrome and I couldn't stay where we were. And I wanted to sell our house and we would just go full-time house sitting. And, and um, you know, that's what we've been doing for the last four years, full-time house sitting. And we don't own a home anymore. Just move up and down the country and you're quite inspired by the places that we went. But, you know, in the early days of the the house sitting I was very low and then of course COVID struck and, and suddenly the house sits um, disappeared and they weren't anymore and um, there was nowhere to stay and we didn't have much money and we decided we'd have to go into a, um, a month in a tiny little um, tiny house Airbnb in the back of somebody's orchard. Um, it was beautiful and peaceful and lovely but it was so tiny you know I couldn't paint and my husband couldn't write and we were kind of stuck there and we had no internet and just got more and more low and depressed and um, felt that, you know, what was I doing? And, um, you know, after 20, 30 years, 20 years of painting and um, feeling like it was still a struggle and I still wasn't being recognised, you know, or, or um, understood as an artist, and um, I ended up having to see counsellor and getting some psychology appointments and counselling. And and the um, psychologist said to me, look, you're going to have to do some journaling. It would just help if you just do some writing. And um, so I went home and I didn't have a, um, you know, a lined book. All I had was a tiny little, you know, those sketchbooks that you put in your back pocket and you take out and draw things when you can. And... Um, I just took one of these little um, blank paged notebooks out and started writing um, and you know I'm not a writer I'm not a words person and really there was only a, a couple of lines of writing and then I would start doodling and um, I'd be just doodling in the corner and then I'd just kind of get caught up in it and I'd, the doodling got bigger and bigger and then I'd spread across the whole page and then there'd be only two words on the page and all the rest was this kind of doodle that went on and on. And um, and then I said to my you know, my husband, Keith, you know, we're going to have to go to the shop and get a bigger book because, and I need some felt tip pens. So, you know, we put our masks on and our gloves and walked up to the local dairy, which is like a little superette up the road, and got in the queue and waited to go in because of COVID and you had to wait and um, went in and bought the cheap set of felt tip pens and, um, and another slightly bigger little notebook and went home and did bigger doodles and drawings and, and you know, and it just went on and on from there. And I said to Kev, you know, we, I need a bigger book. And this is, and so... By that time, one of the stationery shops, you could click and click. So I ordered, um, you know, a proper sketch pad, you know, an A4 and um, and some better pens and went and got those and started drawing again. And, and from that, you know, the drawings just grew and grew and became more and more um, detailed, finely, finely detailed and um, multi-layered and everything had patterns in it and every inch of the paper was full of um, drawing and you know I had to get bigger paper because that wasn't big enough anymore and I'd found out about the um, ink pen pencils and um, started using ink pencils which you can draw on like a colouring and pencil and then you, you um, brush water over it and it becomes ink and um, so now I needed, you know, Bristol ball paper because it had to be firm enough to take the, the layers of washes of water on it. And I'd get the biggest size you could possibly get. And these drawings just got huge. And um, and so, yeah, so it, it was kind of surprising. It was actually pretty shocking because I'd always told people I, I couldn't draw and um, that I was just, basically a painter and I never really did compositions or drawing and suddenly here I was doing these huge drawings and um, you know the COVID we we got a time when we were allowed to get out and about again and we were in Auckland and I said to Keith there was this really 
good gallery that I like that was down by the water in um, Devonport, which is just across the ferry from Auckland CBD. And um, I wanted to go there and um, see if I could show him some of my paintings. You know, I didn't think much of my drawing and I just thought maybe he'll look at my paintings. And um, so I took and um, I made an appointment with him and he said, yeah, you can bring some in. And I took in these big reef paintings that I'd been doing and, and um, you know, Mike from the gallery was one of those really quiet kind of person, people that kind of contemplates what he's looking at for a long time. He doesn't say much and I was extremely nervous because he wasn't saying anything and um, while he was looking at the paintings, I was looking around the gallery and I saw this folder, you know, of this stack of um, drawings and prints that were there and um, I was looking through them and I thought, oh, my drawings are actually, you know, as good as these drawings and um, I wonder what he would think about the drawings and um, so I remembered that in one of the boxes that the paintings had come in, there was one drawing, a large drawing and so I took it out and I put it on the bench top, you know, where his desk was and um, Mike came over to me and said, well, you guys go and have a coffee and I'll have a look and then come back in half an hour. So we took off and had a coffee and then went back half an hour later and I stood beside him waiting to see what he said. And he said, um, yeah, the, you know, the paintings are they're good and I can see that they would sell and people would like them and I'm sure you'll, you'll have some market for them, he said. And no, but really the the paintings are your bread and butter, he said, but your drawing is your legacy. And that was really the nicest thing anybody had ever said to me about my art. And I was just stunned. <laughs> and it was just like a light bulb went on and, and it was the, you know, it was the, the a huge moment in my life. And, you know, I, I was so grateful to him for saying it and, and Mike said to me, if you, you know, if you come back sometime with some more of your drawings, I'll take a look at them. And and I thought, oh, OK. So I went away and um, decided I had to buy a whole lot of Bristol board and, and better pens and um, better ink and um, start doing big drawings. And I did a whole series of about um, 18 large drawings and and a time later, you know, quite a while later, because they were very intricate, I took them to the gallery and I said to Mike, um, would you like to take a look at my drawings? And, you know, he'd actually forgotten about me and my drawing and, and he was probably thinking, what the hell, who is this person? And um, he said, OK, I'll take a look. And I pulled them out, these large drawings, and he started going through them and he didn't say anything again. And I'm thinking, oh, no, he doesn't like them. And getting really kind of anxious about it and then he just turned to me and he said I suppose you're going to need a show and I said yeah well a show would be great and he booked me in and really haven't looked back since then and um, Mike's given me solo shows ever since and those drawings have kind of just um, grown and grown until I started buying board um, um, framed boards and doing large, you know, one, two metre drawings that, um, you know, I've just, which are just huge and, and um, you can see the images of. And um, they've been good, they've been well accepted and, and I've been selling them and, and, I, and I feel like I found myself and I feel like... Um, I I know who I am and, and I'm painting me or drawing me and I'm in it's true and it's authentic and it's real and, and um you know I, I couldn't be happier. I'm just absolutely thrilled. And yeah, it's just you never know out of that horrible time and all those long years of practice that got me to this point. In the last couple of years, I've been concentrating on the sun and moon um, paintings and the 
I call them paintings, they're painting drawings. Um, and it's really, it's a, it's a time thing. You know, the, the drawings have multiple suns and multiple moons and them rising and falling and eclipses and half moons. And it's, it's a kind of a time thing. It's, it's a sense of movement and time and shifting and the, the kind of endless motion of life that just keeps moving on and on and it comes through in the work and um, the, the moons and the suns, you know, they're kind of this perfect geometric circle, you know, shape, this orb and everything around it kind of um, pushes in around it and fills in the spaces around it with the plants and the images and the the landscapes that kind of disappear into the distance and um, I, I want people to see what they what they want in the work I want the idea you know for me the my idea of the viewer is somebody who walks into the gallery sees the work and goes oh, okay that's that's you know something to look at and but then they have to stop and then they have to stop and stand there and look and look and look because they're they're not instant paintings they're not paintings that you just look at and go okay that's a landscape I know what that is I recognize it the work is so intricate and detailed that people find different images inside the images and landscapes inside landscapes and they've got a lot of depth to them and they you know they take a very very long time to make and I think they take just as long to look at and to discover and to to find things in and, and I think that gives them a you know a great sense of depth to them and I hope people see that when they look at them. When I'm working I I don't listen to music at all, I listen to audiobooks and I think the the reasoning behind that is that um, the because I'm listening to a story unfold I stop thinking about the work and what I'm making and uh, the hand and eye just kind of takes over and there's no deliberate intent involved. There's no preliminary drawing involved either. The, the one area just kind of flows into the next area and um, builds up around the board as you're working and um, by listening to the books there's, there's no sort of overthinking. It just comes organically from you and I you know and people talk about the zone as an artist and getting in the zone and I don't like to be cliched about these things but yeah I definitely get in the zone and <laughs> my husband would say I do because you know I kind of I'm, it's almost like I'm not in the room because I'm so involved in what I'm doing and so um, intense about it. The artists that I look at the most on uh, Instagram and there's, I really love Shara Hughes, the American artist who does the, the large um, landscapes and flower paintings. I've just been following her forever and I love the work by Cecily Brown, the um, British figurative abstract artist and her work is stunning and one piece came to New Zealand and was in the gallery in Auckland and I just stood in front of it and wanted to weep. I was just so happy to see it there and so excited and um, I really love the Australian artist Elizabeth Cummings. She's you know quite elderly now and she's still creating the most stunningly beautiful uh, works with so much mark making and so much heart to them and you know, artists like that, you know, no matter how young or how old, they're, they're all so passionate about their work and it's so exciting and, you know, I'm just so happy to um, to feel that, I, you know, I've got a little bit of something to contribute there and, and I'll just keep doing it. So thanks for having me.